Good morning. It is our privilege to be here together to do our part two of our survey of the Olivet Discourse. If you were with us last Sunday, we began our study of this portion of scripture that is known as the Olivet Discourse uh, because, of course, the Lord Jesus is sitting upon the Mount of Olives as he delivers this discourse, and it's all about the second coming of Christ. And again, if you were with us last time, I introduced this concept, but because of the whole coronavirus and the uh, kind of worldwide quarantine restrictions that are taking place, and it's got a lot of people thinking about the end times. I've, I've received a number of questions concerning the end times, particularly Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus speaks of a period of history known as the beginning of sorrows, which is really what we tried to cover last time. And so the goal of today is to kind of do part two of that survey through the Olivet Discourse and to look through the latter half of the discourse and then address some of the questions that we that came up last week, particularly concerning the rapture, which we did not have time to comment on thoroughly last time. And so that's our goal for today. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Thank the Lord for this opportunity, and then we'll jump in. All right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for today. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to meet via technology. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that is ours to do so. We mourn the, the situation around the globe with the coronavirus and the uh, various, Lord, the, the dangers that that poses, the deaths that have ensued, the uh, just frustrations that uh, people are living through, the fear, uh, the inconvenience, etc. So, Lord, we take all of those hardships and we entrust them into your hand and we just ask that you would guide and direct in this time that we have together as we continue to look at your word. May you use this opportunity to instruct us, to encourage us, and help us, gracious Father, to have greater confidence in who you are as we look at the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, which foretold of these times that we're in, but also times ahead of us. And so, Lord, be our guide as we look at this portion of scripture for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you are uh, with us, if you were with us last week, we began our look, as I said a moment ago, at the Olivet Discourse, and our main focus, practically speaking, was in verse 35 of this discourse, in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35, when Jesus says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And we focused on that last week, and the, the incredible practical import that that is. This week, however, what I would like to focus on is, of course, the latter half of the discourse, but particularly the practical import that you see right there uh, in your notes or up on the screen that have to do with the verbiage, the command, given in Matthew 24, verse 42, and it also so shows up in Matthew 25, verse 13, where Jesus says, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Or again, reading chapter 25, verse 13, Jesus says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. And so uh, the emphasis that I'd like to make today as we examine this second half or the latter half, latter part of the Olivet Discourse, is of course this idea of waiting, watching, being alert, being watchful as we await the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let me just by way of reminder tell you or kind of pick up where we left off last time and remind ourselves what, what we were looking at. Recall that the two chapters of Matthew 24 and 5 are known as the Olivet Discourse. This discourse serves as the single greatest concentration of prophetic teaching in the ministry of Jesus. The single greatest example or concentration of prophetic teaching in the ministry of Jesus. That is, Jesus made many comments throughout his life and ministry regarding the end times, etc. But the place where we see it the most is in this Olivet Discourse. And we last time, if you were with us, we looked at <clears throat> the setting for the Olivet Discourse. We looked at the last several verses of Matthew 23 into the first several verses of, of Matthew 24, which give us the setting of the Olivet Discourse, where the four disciples... Uh, Matt, or excuse me, uh, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, the Gospel of Mark, recall, 
gives us those names, but four disciples approach Jesus on the Mount of Olives. That's why we call it the Olivet Discourse. And they ask Jesus concerning a prediction that he just made as they were exiting the city of Jerusalem after Jesus himself had been rejected. He leaves the city of Jerusalem. He sits upon the Mount of Olives. While they're leaving, the disciples are, are boasting in the temple. Recall that was a major source of Jewish pride. And they were really examining the temple, boasting about its greatness, uh, pointing it out to Jesus. The, Jesus then makes a prediction concerning the destruction of the temple. So the disciples gather around him to ask for some more clarity concerning this. And so they sit down upon the Mount of Olives, and Jesus begins a discourse. So after examining the setting for the discourse that we looked at last time, we also then looked at the structure of the Olivet Discourse. We looked at the structure of the Olivet Discourse. And then, and which we'll review here just briefly in a moment, but then we also began looking at the sequence of end times events. But in order to do so, we had to go backwards into the book of Daniel to really set the timeline for the sequence of the end times events. And so again, just kind of catching us up to speed uh, where we left off last time, as we surveyed the sequence of end times events last week, we noted that we must anchor our timeline. The source that anchors our timeline comes from Daniel chapter 9, a passage known as the 70 weeks prophecy, if you recall this. The reason we do this, we have to go back to Daniel chapter 9 to anchor our timeline, is because in the Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24, in verse 15 of that chapter, Jesus alludes, let me just read that verse, he says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso reads, let him understand, and then on he goes. But the point is, Jesus alludes to Daniel chapter 9, as the anchor point for the end times sequence of events. And so if you were unfamiliar with Daniel chapter 9, Matthew 24 would make little sense. And so that's why we went backwards and we looked at Matt, or Daniel excuse me, chapter 9, and that made up a, a good portion of our study last week. Here's a summary of what we discovered there in, in Daniel chapter 9. What Jesus will label later label in the Olivet Discourse as the Great Tribulation and he does so down there in verse 21, Matthew 24, verse 21. But what Jesus labels in the Olivet Discourse as the Great Tribulation is also known as the latter half of Daniel's 70th week. This period of Daniel's 70th week, that is, is a time period of seven years, which will begin when a ruler, the worldwide ruler of a worldwide government, a global government that the Bible says will exist in the end times, the head of that government that we sometimes call the Antichrist, or, and he goes by many titles in the scripture, but when that worldwide ruler makes a covenant with Israel, which probably we can't be conclusive, but that covenant probably has something to do with the, the new temple that they will build and the beginning of the sacrificial system that we talked about a little bit last week and we got a few questions on. But when that worldwide ruler signs that covenant with Israel for a period of seven years, that will begin the final week or the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. That period of seven, seven years, however, halfway through that, as you can see point three there in your notes, this ruler will violate, the Antichrist will violate his own covenant with Israel after three and a half years, or as Daniel says, midweek mid-period, mid, you know, that would be three and a half years, middle of the seven-year period. And when he breaks that covenant, he will violate that covenant and desecrate the temple in Jerusalem. This is probably what Paul is referring to in the New Testament, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when he describes how that man of sin, the son of perdition, two more titles for the Antichrist, will sit in the temple of God declaring himself to be God. That has not happened yet in human history. And if we're to read those prophecies literally, which I think we should, right? The first 69 weeks of Daniel's prophecy were fulfilled literally. Why not the 70th week? So if we read that prophecy literally, then we are still awaiting a literal temple to stand in literally in Jerusalem. We will have a literal worldwide government, the leader of which will sign a covenant with Israel, which will last for seven years, three and a half years into that covenant, that uh, leader will violate the covenant, desecrate the temple, declare himself to be God, and demand the whole world worship him. And yet, as Daniel chapter 9 points out, 
this period will end with the destruction of this tyrant, this antichrist, as we sometimes call him, this final one world government leader, will not last forever. Rather, he will come to a his own demise. God will bring judgment upon him, particularly at the return of the Lord Jesus. And so, as we talked about last time, the prophecy that we see in Daniel chapter 9, much of it has already been fulfilled. The 70 weeks verse of, you know, worth of prophecy there, much of it has already been fulfilled. We've already seen the, the first coming and the death of the Messiah. That took place in A.D. 33, nearly 2,000 years ago. We also saw, as prophesied in Daniel chapter 9, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. That happened, A.D. 70. We then saw, after that event, the dispersion of the Jews, or what we call the Diaspora. In fact, if you're with us for our Patterns of Prophecy series, where we talk through the, the history of modern Israel, we talked much, we gave a whole lecture, or two, I forget, uh, to this idea of the dispersion, the diaspora. That's been fulfilled. The fourth point there in your notes, the regathering of the Jews and the reoccupation of the city of Jerusalem has happened recently in the modern era. The regathering of the Jewish people took place, well, it, it was going, and it still technically is ongoing, but we often label 1948 the, when the Jewish nation declared her independence and named the country Israel, the rebirth of the nation, the political entity of Israel, took place in 1948. And then, of course, through the wars that they, particularly the Six-Day War in 1967, Israel regained the city of Jerusalem, and they have control over it. Now, though we talked about this a little bit last time, they regained control of the Temple Mount during that period. They nonetheless gave the control back to the Waqf, W-A-Q-F, the Muslim authority there, the Islamic authority in Jerusalem, and they did that for political purposes. So the Jewish temple, the new Jewish temple that will be standing for the Antichrist to desecrate, according to end times prophecy, that isn't in existence yet. Um, however, after last week's uh, lecture, it was kind of fascinating, uh, a fellow in the church sent me an article that I was unaware of. It just took place a couple of days, or I think uh, maybe last week, like a Saturday, last Saturday perhaps. Um, there, he sent me an article that is, it was describing how because of the coronavirus, the WAQ, the W-A-Q-F, the Muslim Authority, has shut down the Temple Mount. They themselves have fled the scene because of the coronavirus. And so the, for the first time in decades, Jews have begun making their way up to the Temple Mount to worship there. And <laughs> I thought that was kind of fascinating. And because, by the way, because there is an overt amount of rain this year in Israel, the old um, mikvah that are standing, or, or that are hewn into the rock, and they exist. They exist in the first century. They still exist today. They've been uncovered because of archaeology. They, again, recall a mikvah is a big ceremonial baptismal, basically, a bath. And they exist on the southern steps of the Temple Mount. If you're with me in Jerusalem, uh, some of you folks here from Ruby Mountain Bible went with me to Jerusalem last year. We, we stood on those steps, on the southern steps of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and we looked at those mikvah. Those are probably the very mikvah that uh, the first uh, Christians, after Peter's sermon at Pentecost, it says that there were thousands baptized. Where did that take place? Probably right there in those mikvah. But according to Jewish tradition, you cannot approach the Temple Mount unless you are first baptized, right? You've got to dip yourself in a ritual bath and then ascend into, you know, up to the Temple Mount. Well, modern Jews in the last couple of weeks have been doing that because the Waqf have fled the Temple Mount because of the coronavirus, and many Jews are baptizing themselves in those mikvah filled by rainwater, and then they're making their way up to the Temple Mount to worship there. And it's kind of, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, it just kind of made me laugh. But anyways, the point is, whether this is a precursor or not, it, it is nonetheless, according to prophecy, the Jews will, at some point, regain control of the Temple Mount. They will rebuild a Jewish temple and recommence the sacrifices, the sacrificial system, which has not yet happened, but it will happen according to the Bible, according to Daniel chapter 9, and it will happen at some point. And so the sequence of end times events that we have examined, uh, that we just kind of briefly touched upon last week, and I'd like to take a little bit further in our study here today, the sequence of end times events that the Olivet Discourse gives to us 
is, number one, a period known as the beginning of sorrows. This describes the period of history from now until the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. This is really where we made it last time in our, in our lecture. We didn't get much further than that. But in Matthew 24, verses 4 to 14 there, Jesus describes this time as a, the, the time period of the beginning of sorrows. We'll reread that in just a moment, or at least a portion of it, um, and we're, we'll try and clip along here. But the beginning of sorrows is the time period in which we ourselves are living, but it really won't terminate. It, it's a broad umbrella term that covers, yes, what we're living through now, but it will, like we said before, the beginning of sorrows is a picture of birth pains um, that you know, will, you know, contractions that will grow in frequency and intensity. And, and you know, they'll, they'll come closer together. They'll last longer. They'll get worse and worse and worse until, all the way up until, including, you know, the beginning of that 70th week, this, the first half of that, the three and a half years, is also known as the beginning of sorrows. I mean, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Read the book of Revelation, chapter 6 sometime, where we see this idea of wars and pestilence and famine, earthquakes, etc., are increasing and getting worse. They're increasing in frequency and intensity all the way up into the abomination of desolation that takes place in the middle of in Daniel's 70th week. Well, again, we just continuing in your notes there, the signing of the treaty, as we've already said, with Israel will initiate the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel, the final seven years of human history. The abomination of desolation, which is the Antichrist standing in the temple, declaring himself as God, demanding the, worship, the Lord or the world worship him, that abomination of desolation will mark the midpoint of those final seven years. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 24, verses 15 to 24. Then the second coming of Christ itself is the climax and culmination of all of history. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 24, verses 25 to 31. And so our goal today, what I want to cover today, is to number one, I just want to quickly, and we got a lot of material, so I'm going to try my best to make it you know, as, as quick and, and generic as possible. And again, our, our goal is to take questions, field some questions, uh, do a bit of a Q&A here uh, today after the lecture itself. But I want to quickly finish our survey of the Olivet Discourse. Then secondly, because we got so many questions about this last week, I want to spend some time summarizing the various positions on the rapture of the church. And so I want to deal with that a little bit more intentionally this week because we had so many questions about it last week. So let's revisit briefly the structure of the Olivet Discourse itself in Matthew 24 and 5, and then we'll, we'll survey the, the rest of it. Just, you know, as broad brush as we can, and we can deal with details if you've got questions concerning those details. But the Olivet Discourse has is, is got a very simple flow of thought, where Jesus, number one, he describes a time that he labels as the beginning of sorrows, which is the time period we're living in. Right? That's the idea of wars and rumors of wars and... Um, you know, the, the pestilence, famine, plague, etc. And we talked about that last week, and that, that's a time period that we are currently living in. And Jesus describes that. But that time period will also go all the way up into the abomination of desolation, which is what we're going to talk about next. Jesus anchors the timeline, point two there in your notes, Jesus anchors the timeline of the sequence of end times events with the reference to the abomination of desolation beginning in verse 15 of, of the passage. And he labels this period, particularly the final three and a half years of the uh, 70th week of Daniel, Jesus labels that as, quote, the great tribulation. And he covers that in Matthew 24, verses 15 to 22. But then what happens next is Jesus will then describe the second coming itself. That's really, remember, what the disciples asked. Well, hey, what are the signs? What And when will these things be? And so Jesus is he's at, he's answering those questions by describing the signs, the events leading up into that second coming. He will then describe the second coming itself, and then he will discuss the issue of the timing. So he describes his second coming in verses 23 to 31 of Matthew chapter 24. We'll read that in a moment. And then finally, Jesus is going to discuss the timing of these events. That question of when, uh, regarding timing, when will these things be? Jesus is going to answer that in verses 32 to 42 of Matthew chapter 24. And then, we're not going to take, take the time to really rehearse it here today because I want to get to the rapture question. 
Um, and it, there's just a lot of material to cover, so we won't get to this today. But beginning in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 43, excuse me, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 24, verse 43, going through Matthew chapter 25, really the rest of the Olivet Discourse, what Jesus is going to do is he's going to give a series of parables, all of which are basically giving us the same uh, command, same exhortation, which was the opening slide right, as we open and introduce the, the concept here today, namely that we are to watch, we are to wait, we are to be attentive and careful, watching the world, watching the signs that Jesus said uh, will come and precede his coming, and then, of course, be ready for the second coming itself. And so that's really the latter half of the discourse. We're not going to take the time to walk through all those parables, because like I said, there's, there's, uh, it's quite a bit of material they are basically, obviously, they're, they're worth studying, to be sure. I mean, you need to read them, and you need to, need to study them. But we're not going to take the time to study them today, because I want to get to the rapture question. And so let's jump back in to our survey of the Olivet Discourse, and pick it up kind of where we left off last time. And we're going to discuss, in particular, the Abomination of Desolation, which we actually already talked about last week in reference to, or in answer to, a question that came in. So we can kind of make quick work of this. But let me reread, if you've got your Bibles open there, Matthew 24, uh, verse 3 and following. It says this, So, and he, Jesus, sat down upon the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And Jesus answered them, right, it says in verse 4. So again, they asked basically two questions. What are going to be, you know, when are these things going to be, and what are the signs that will precede it? So Jesus is going to answer those two questions, but he's going to do it in reverse. Remember this? He's first going to deal with the signs, and then he's going to deal with the, uh, the sequence, or the, the, the timing. So verse 4, Jesus answered unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things shall come to pass, but the end is not yet. Right? So he says, hey, the end's not coming, but you're just, this is going to be common to the age the ages, between the time of Jesus all the way up until, you know, the second coming. Verse 7, he says, For nation shall rise against nation. That would be a local war. If you remember our discussion from last week. Kingdom will rise against kingdom. That would be a global war, what you and I might call the world wars, which we had, we've had two of them so far in history, but we might have more. You know, I'm not saying those are the only two we'll have, but... Um, Anyways, but the whole point is these signs, this beginning of sorrows, the birth pangs, are going to grow in frequency and intensity. Uh, verse 7, for nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, there will be famines and pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. We talked about that last time. These are the beginning of sorrows, the birth pangs. Verse 9, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and they shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall be... And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise, and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. In other words, we didn't deal with this a whole lot last time, and I'm just going to briefly speak about it here, but verses 9 to 14 there is describing a period well, it, it's describing the persecution of the church and the proclamation of the gospel, which will be common throughout all of history, but it will grow in intensity and frequency, just, it's, you know, just like the birth pains idea. It will grow in frequency and intensity as the end times approach, particularly as the 70th week of Daniel begins with the signing of that treaty, right? It lasts for seven years the first three and a half years of which, and especially the last three and a half years, will have the most intense worldwide persecution of the church and true believers uh, that history has ever seen. And, by the way, history is showing that out. I mean, showing that, right, even right now. As we, and we talk about this, I throw this statistic out every once in a while. Uh, the Voice of the Martyrs, for instance, is a resource that talks about this. But there have been more Christians martyred in the last 100 years of human history, from us, the last century, the 1900s, 
There have been more Christians martyred in the last hundred years of human history than all of history before that combined. The point is, just what Jesus said, persecution and the proclamation of the gospel are going to increase as time goes on and as we not near into the end, persecution is just going to get worse and worse. That is happening, but it's going to get worse. We in America have really enjoyed a reprieve, a couple hundred years of freedom that's unique to human history. And don't be you know, fooled or naive enough to think that we will never be persecuted as Christians in America. We will be. It's, it's coming. Uh, at some point, I don't know when, but it's coming, according to the Bible. And so, and it's happening to our brothers and sisters all over the world right now. So, just be aware of that. But read again, Revelation 6, Revelation 7. During that 70th week of Daniel, it'll be the worst ever persecution and proclamation of the gospel because of the you know, ceiling of the 144,000, and we could go on and get into that. But the point is, the persecution of the church, the proclamation of the gospel, are going to be global. Uh... Now, you know, we're getting there, but also in particularly in the end of times. But now, pick it up in verse 15. Matthew 24, verse 15, Jesus says, But when you therefore see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. And the idea is there, the abomination is probably the image, which again, Revelation 13 describes that image. But the idol that the Antichrist will set up, the idol of himself, he'll set it up. That's, that's what it means, to stand in the holy place, is the idol will be put, the idol of the Antichrist will be put into the Jewish temple, and he will declare himself as God in the Jewish temple, demanding the whole world to worship him. Read Second Thessalonians 2, Revelation chapter uh, 13. They talk about this in more detail. But Jesus says, when you see that happen, then read and understand what's about to take place. Verse 16, he says, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray you that the flight that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not seen since the beginning of the world to this time. No, never, ever shall be. In other words, this will be the worst period in all of human history. These three and a half years after the abomination of desolation, but before the return of Jesus in the clouds. That three and a half years of human history will be the worst period history has ever seen. And you think the panic and the fear uh, you know, that's, that we see right now with the coronavirus is bad? We haven't seen anything yet. When we are dealing with a threat to one or two percent of the world population, through the uh, coronavirus, think about the book of Revelation when one-third, one-quarter or one-third of the world's population will be wiped out by a plague. Thirty percent, you know, over thirty percent. The point is, we the fear and the panic that we're experiencing right now is nothing compared to what's coming. But nonetheless, he says this will be the worst time in period, you know, time period in human history. And then to read verse 22, he says, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. In other words, that worst period of human history is not going to go on perpetually. It'll only be three and a half years before Jesus comes back to terminate the Antichrist and to bring back world peace. Unprecedented peace, by the way. But the point is, that I want to make in verses 15 to 22 here, what Jesus calls the abomination of desolation, this is the big sign that we're looking for. Obviously, there's some prerequisites to it. There has to be a temple standing, you know, etc. We talked about already. But this idea of the abomination of desolation is a period of history that we haven't seen yet. And some people, however, Bible interpreters, particularly ones called preterists, they will say this already happened. But as I have there up on the screen, and we rever rehearsed this last week so I can make quick work of it, but I... Uh, I rehearsed this in answer to a question last week, but the abomination of desolation that Jesus speaks of here, I don't think it's happened yet. Not if we understand prophecy and history correctly. Because notice, again, as I throw it up there in your notes, the abomination of desolation was first spoken of by Daniel the prophet. That's what Jesus says. We read that last week. That's Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. That took place about 515 B.C. Well, some will say that already happened. Remember Antiochus Epiphanes. 
And that's the, a story recorded in the books of Maccabees, in the Apocrypha. And yet I'm going to say that that did not fulfill Daniel's prophecy. It foreshadowed Daniel's prophecy. Why? Well, just recall what happened about 168 to 167 B.C., and this is not in the Bible, it's recorded in the Apocrypha, the books of Maccabees, but a ruler of Syria, the eighth ruler of the Syrian dynasty, a guy by the name of Antiochus IV, or Antiochus Epiphanes was his uh, nickname. It's a Greek word that means the appearance of God, Epiphany. And so he actually declared himself to be God, Antiochus did. He wanted worship. Um, he was crazy. The Jews, instead of calling him Epiphanes, called him Epimenes, which is a play on words, and it actually you know, means the crazy one. But the point is, Antiochus IV, in about 168 BC, he outlawed Torah regarding, uh, or Torah reading, excuse me, and he outlawed circumcision. He slaughtered a sow or a pig on the altar in Jerusalem. He erected an idol of Zeus in the Holy of Holies. He desecrated the temple, in other words. This began the famous Maccabean Revolt, which led to the retaking of the temple and its rededication in 167. And when that happened, oh, excuse me, I think the... the uh, desecration takes place in 168-67, and then the rededication in 64, if I recall correctly. Um, but that is commemorated even to this day in, a, in the holiday known as Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. But the point that I'm trying to make is that all of that happened almost two, 200 years before Jesus makes the comments that he's making here in Matthew chapter 24. So in other words, that is past history. The Maccabean revolt is over. Jesus himself attended a feast of Hanukkah in John chapter 10. In other words, that period of history, the abomination of desolation that took place by Antiochus, that could not be what Jesus is talking about here because it's, it's before Jesus. Jesus comes along 200 years later and then he says, look for the abomination of desolation. So he's saying there's one coming after him. Does that make sense? And so Jesus, speaking these words in Matthew 24, he's speaking these in, in the year 33, A.D., not B.C., A.D. Paul then, a few years later, in 2 Thessalonians 2, also talks about an abomination that'll, of desolation that will take place later than Paul. Then the book of Revelation, which I'm going to argue, when was Revelation written? 90 to 95, probably 95, AD. In other words, what happened in AD 70, the destruction of the temple by the Romans in AD 70, did not fulfill this prophecy. Because we read the book of Revelation, which was written 30, well, 25 years after Jerusalem is destroyed, and he says it's still coming. It hasn't happened yet. And again, even as we talked about last time, there was a foiled attempt by Emperor Caligula about AD 40 to 41, while the temple still stood, before it was destroyed in AD 70, there was a, 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 an attempt by Emperor Caligula to place his, an image of himself, an idol of himself, in the Jewish temple. And he wanted to be declared, you know, demand worship. But recall, according to history, Josephus records this for us, Caligula died before that, era, that order was carried out and it never happened. So the abomination of desolation, as described by Jesus, as described by Paul, as described by Revelation, did not happen uh, before the, the temple was destroyed in AD 70. It didn't. Revelation comes along, 25 years later, says it's still coming. There has not been a Jewish temple standing in you know, the city of Jerusalem on the Temple Mount since AD 70. We're looking at almost 2,000 years later, there's still no Jewish temple, but it, were, it seems to be close. Like, I mean, according to everything we can see over there in the modern day, they want the temple to be built, and, and it seems to be inevitable at some point. It's going to happen. But the point I'm trying to make is the abomination of desolation that Jesus tells us about here hasn't happened yet. It's something still future to us that we are to be watching for. That's the point. All right. But after Jesus talks about this abomination of desolation, which will bring on the worst period in human history, he then gets, in, in particular, gets more specific about the second coming itself. Let's read verses 23 and following, uh, down to verse uh, 31. Jesus says this, Matthew 24, verse 23. 
Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, do not go forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Behold, believe it not. For as the lightning comes out of the east, and shines even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation in those days. All right? And again, I uh, probably, because he calls it tribulation in verse 21, we're talking about the last three and a half years here. Right? He says, after that period of in the, the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon will not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Just read the book of Revelation that also talks about this, these various phenomena taking place in those, those, uh, that, those last final years. He says, verse 30, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, in those verses, verses 23 to 31, Jesus describes the event, the event that is the climax and culmination of all of human history, namely the second coming of Jesus Christ. The first part of this text, in verses 23 and 4, Jesus basically gives a quick warning. Don't fall for false Christ, false Christs or prophets, even if they are miraculous. Don't fall for them. And examples of this through history, and I'm not going to get into it, but the Second Jewish War takes place in 132 to 135 B.C. There was a guy by the name of Bar Kokhba that claimed to be the Messiah. And Jesus is saying, don't, tr you know, don't trust in these false messiahs. An example of that would be the Bar Kokhba revolt or modern cults like uh, Mormonism, uh, Jehovah's Witness, other cults that claim to have either seen you know, the, a coming of Christ, to receive new revelation that is contradictory to the scripture. Don't believe them. Because Jesus says, my coming... And he talks about this. This is the point of verses 25 to 28 that we read there. The coming of Christ will be obvious and universal. When you have, for instance, a Muhammad who goes into a, a cave, he supposedly has a vision, and then he comes out and he writes a new book to say, you know, the Quran, and he says, hey, we've got everything wrong. Come over here. I know the truth about the end of times. Jesus says here, don't listen to people like that. When Joseph Smith goes into the woods, he has a vision of the Father and the Son appearing to him, and he comes out with a new religion. Don't listen to it. When, and the point is, when anyone claims to have a new revelation from, uh, of Christ or from Christ, and they say, like it says here in verse 24, they will, there will rise false Christs and false prophets who will show signs and wonders. Some of them will even be miraculous. Talk about the NAR. Boy, don't get me started on that. That's a modern movement, a new apostolic reformation that claims to do the miraculous. And they are twisting and perverting the scripture. He says, don't go there. He says, they, and they, they will be convincing. And they'll say, here's the Christ, or there's the Christ. And you might be tempted to think, man, maybe these guys got something right. Maybe they are the truth. Jesus says, don't fall for it. Why? Because the coming of Christ is going to be obvious. He says, it's just like lightning that starts in the east and goes to the west, and you can't miss it. The whole sky is going to light up. That's what the second, of coming, second coming of Christ will be like. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, for instance, he talks about he will come in the clouds of heaven and all the world will see him. You can't miss it. It will be too obvious. And so the point is, don't fall for false prophets and false Christs. Wait for the true Christ to come back, just like he said he would. All right? Well, then, it tells us in, in the latter half of that passage, verses 29 to 31, that his coming, when he comes, it will be accompanied by cosmic signs, global mourning, and the gathering of the elect. And, in other words, we'll get to this more when we talk about the rapture in just a few minutes, 
But this gathering that's referenced in verse 31 is variously interpreted. Some, a post-tribulational position of the rapture, will say that's the rapture. And the rapture doesn't happen until after the tribulation time period. Um, it, it's a good argument. But it's not conclusive or airtight. Because there's other ways to interpret that. Others interpret this gathering there in verse 31 as the regathering of scattered Israel. Just like it said, you know, in verses 16 and following, when the abomination of desolation takes place, any believer, anyone who is, a, you know, Israelite, anyone in the city of Jerusalem, anyone who is a Christian, believer in Jesus, he says, get out of there, because it's going to be the worst persecution the world's ever seen. The Antichrist is going to unleash his wrath upon the world, and he says, get out of there. And so the idea of all the people of God that scatter from the city of Jerusalem, the regathering in verse 31 might be just referencing that. Or it might be a reference to the rapture. It's kind of hard to say. So we'll come back and talk about that in just a second. <clears throat> but the point I want to make is that this second coming that's described here is Jesus answering the, the, the questions of the disciples. What will be the signs leading up to the second coming? Well, Jesus answers that question in the first half of the Olivet Discourse. But now, beginning in verse 31 and following, Jesus is going to get to their other question. When will these things be? When will these things be? So we're going to pick up in chapter 24, verse 32 to 42 here, where Jesus is going to answer that question. He's going to begin with a parable known as the parable of the fig tree. We'll read it in just a second. That's verses 32 to 35. Then he's going to basically answer the question by saying, that day or hour nobody knows. In other words, here's the signs to watch out for. But when is it happening? I'm not telling you. That's kind of his point, okay? And so that's why we, he gets to the latter half of the, of the Olivet Discourse, and he says, watch, wait, be alert. Because we know with the signs that will precede his coming, so he says, watch for it. But when will they happen? I'm not telling you. The exact day and hour? We don't know. Because, and why not? Why doesn't God just nail it down and give us a calendar date? Because it would then, then we wouldn't have faith. We wouldn't be watching and waiting and trusting. He says, you just hang in there, and I'm not going to tell you when this is happening. And so that's really the point of this next part, okay? So let's read it. Verse 24, chapter 24, verse 32 says, Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is, is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise you, when you shall see all these things, these signs that he just talked about, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. We're going to come back to that verse because that's a very controversial, largely misunderstood verse. But then verse 35, he says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. He says, you can take this to the bank. This is true statement. This is That was our emphasis last time, that we can trust in Jesus because his prophecy is true and it will come to pass. But then verse 36, he says, But of that day and hour, no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only knows, all right? He says, that day and hour knows no man, not the angels, but only my Father. He says, verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they knew not until the flood came. And the point is, Noah knew because God said, that, you know, what would happen beforehand. And, you know, he had the signs to look for, if you will. But the rest of the world who didn't believe in Noah's message, they had no idea until these things happened. In a similar way, and the phrase might mean more than that, which would derail and hijack our discussion, but what does it mean, the days of Noah, and the whole, you know, uh, Nephilim thing? We're not going to get into that today. We've talked about that before. But the, the days of Noah could be a loaded phrase. But at the least, it means that just like Noah entered the ark, but the rest of the world, it's like they didn't even see the rain coming, even though they were warned, they didn't believe it. They didn't pay attention to it. And so when it came, it was too late. And so Jesus is saying, you do the reverse. You do the opposite. You listen to my words. Know that it's coming eventually. Watch. And when it comes, you're not surprised. Right? That's his point. So he says, they knew not until the flood came and they took them all away. So shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women should be grinding at the mill, one taken and the other at left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. All right. Now, again, we're going to address these just as quickly as we can. 
uh, these verses, verses 40 and 41, many believe that is an allusion to the rapture, which it might be. Uh, it might be a reference to the rapture, or it's a reference to destruction. And the idea is, is those who were awaiting and watching for the period of Jesus, the coming of Christ, are like Noah. They'll be saved. But those who were not, those who rejected the message, were not watching for the signs, who didn't believe in Jesus, and now it's too late because Jesus came back, they'll be destroyed. And it's like, you know, two women sitting at the mill. One's a believer, one's not. One will be spared, one's not. So it could be a reference to the rapture, or it could be reference to just simply the destruction uh, of, of sinners and the salvation of the righteous when Jesus does come back. So again, it's not an ironclad, you know, passage here, but we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Okay, so let's talk about just briefly the parable of the fig tree in verses 32 to 34 here. In this passage, when it talks about the parable of the fig tree, it's a really simple point that Jesus is trying to make. He says, just like the budding of fig trees, evidence is that summer is nigh. And we could get lost in the ecology of Israel and we could talk about fig trees and we could talk about their season, this dry season, rainy season, etc. We're not going to do that. But the point is, just like the budding of a fig tree, evidence is summer is nigh. So too, when you see these signs, what signs? Everything he just talked about, the beginning of sorrows, the abomination of desolation, all this stuff that is signaling that it's the final seven years, the final three and a half years of all of human history. He says, when you see those signs, know that the the, the kingdom is not. I'm just about to come back and set up the kingdom. But the big question that everybody asks about this passage is, what is verse 34 talking about? When Jesus says, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. What does he mean? Some people say that Jesus was talking about his original audience. In other words, the disciples' generation. That these disciples won't die until Jesus comes back. But is that True. No, because they died, and Jesus didn't come back. He's not back yet. The abomination of desolation hasn't happened yet. So it doesn't make much sense to say that. But the word generation, some translations, and it is a possible translation of the Greek word, some will say it references this nation. So instead of saying this generation, a reference to time, you should translate it this nation, a reference to the ethnicity of the Jews. That's possible. Because his, that's true. I mean, so far, history, right? I mean, they've, the Jewish people have been the most widely persecuted uh, people through all of human history. And um, they've been almost wiped out several times, like the Holocaust. But they still survive. And the point is, Jesus will, he's promising here, the Jewish nation will survive until, you know, I mean, all the way through history. Okay, that's a viable reading of verse 34. Others, however, see this when he references this generation will not pass away until these things be fulfilled. What generation? Is it the generation of the disciples? No. Is it the nation of Israel at, at large? Maybe. Or it's the generation that sees the signs that were talked about here. The abomination of desolation. Namely. Primarily. In other words, the people who see the abomination of desolation, you can have certainty that Jesus is coming back three and a half years after that. Uh, in other words, that generation, those people who see that abomination of desolation, that sign, that will be the people who see the second coming of Jesus. Does that make sense? That's probably the best way to read that verse, in my humble opinion. I think it's the best one. Because what was really popular way to read that verse for a lot of years was that the budding of the fig tree was interpreted as the rebirth of the nation of Israel. It's a possible interpretation, but they then, a lot of prophecy scholars, started teaching that this generation, like we who saw the rebirth of the nation of Israel in 1948, we will see the second coming of Jesus. And then they, they set parameters on a generation of as being 30 years. Well, we're past 30 years. That was in the 70s. Jesus didn't come. So they said, well, maybe a generation isn't 30 years, maybe it's 60 years. All right? 
Well, we've now passed 60 years. Jesus didn't come. And so they're like, well, maybe the generation is 100 years. You see my point? The point is, maybe that, that's a possible interpretation, that the rebirth of the nation of Israel is the budding of the fig tree, and that within 100 years of that event, which would take us to 2048, we would have the coming of Jesus. That's possible. Um, but I, I just think we shouldn't be dogmatic on that. Because the people who have been dogmatic on that, that it was 30 years, they were wrong. 50 years, they were wrong. 60 years, they were wrong. So the point is, why would we join the crowd of being dogmatic on that and be proven wrong? The point is, hold it tentatively. It hasn't happened yet. It might be a true interpretation of that verse. Time will tell. All right, so, so don't get derailed on that. But that's the main point of the, the budding of the fig tree. Watch for these signs, specifically, I think, the rebuilding of the temple, the signing of the treaty, and then the desecration of that temple, the abomination of desolation. Watch for those, because when they happen, that generation will see the coming of Jesus Christ. That's the point. But, he then, what Jesus does in verses 36 to 42 then, is he, he makes this big deal. He says, but of that day and hour, nobody knows. This is a very specific, that phrase, but of, that's translated in our English, is called a peri-day, that's Greek, a peri-day construction in Greek. This construction occurs 16 times in the New Testament, and it always introduces a change of subject. It always does, uh, every time it appears in the New Testament. It's a very strong way to say, okay, I talked about that, now on to something else. That's what that phrase is talking about, that's what that, you know, peri-day construction is referring to. And what Jesus is doing now is point, second bullet point there in your notes, he's now describing the subject of timing. All right, he's saying, watch for the budding of the fig tree. When these signs start happening, you know that the end is nigh. But when will those signs happen? Nobody knows. He says, I am, that, that day and hour, the Father alone knows. Now, Jesus knows now. When he spoke these words, he didn't know it. But then Revelation chapter 1 says that the Father revealed it to Jesus and he revealed it to John. So the point is, I think Jesus now knows when his second coming will be. Now, he didn't know then when he spoke these words. But we don't know. We don't know the timing. In fact, this was the question the disciples asked right before Jesus was ascending into heaven in Acts chapter 1. They asked again, okay, when's this happening? Is it, is it happening now? And he says, the timing is not for you to know. So this is why we should not be date setters. This is why we shouldn't be saying that Jesus will come 30 years after 1948. Well, he just set a date. Didn't happen. Um, you know, we shouldn't set dates. That's my point. That day and hour, nobody knows. It could happen within any generation. But we don't know which generation will see these signs. That's the point. Why does, does God not give us more specific timing? Like I said before, it's a matter of faith. He wants us, verse 42 of the passage, watch, wait, trust me, hang in there, read my word, believe my word, and watch. Be alert, be sober, and watch. And the word watch there is, is used of a military watch that throughout the night, right, they would change the guard. And he says, and you don't fall asleep while, it's on, while you're on watch. And the point is, be alert, be watchful. That's the point of this. And so, those, though most interpreters see these verses as referencing the events detailed in verses, okay, so, and I'm talking about this verse 36 to 42 here, of that day and hour nobody knows, it's probably referencing the signs that Jesus just talked about. That's the most common interpretation. It's the most common reading. It's just the most straightforward reading of the text, in my opinion, is that what Jesus is saying, the signs that I just told you about, the rebuilding of the temple, the signing of the covenant, the desecration of the temple, he says, you won't see those, or we don't know when you will see those. Nobody knows that day or hour. So verses 36 to 42, talking about timing, is probably answering the question of the disciples. Though some interpreters, some that I respect, say that this totally different subject that verses 36 to 42 is talking about is talking about the rapture. Could be. It's not that clear to me uh, that, that verses 36 to 42 is talking about the rapture. It, it seems in the context 
to be referring to the signs that he just talked about, because that was the question the disciples asked. What are the signs, and when will these happen? And Jesus says, here's the signs, and nobody knows when it's going to happen. Just watch. That's, that makes the most sense to me. Um, but just know, some will read verses 36 to 42 there as a specific ref reference to the rapture. Uh, but that is, in my opinion, harder to defend that view. Okay, so let me summarize the rest of the all that discourse, and then we're going to have to move on to the rapture question. And I might even make this uh, a separate video, because this one's gone long. I've already got an hour on just talking about the uh, Olivet Discourse here. But, and we're doing a video here for the Sunday Sermon, because last, and we had some requests to do that, because last week, you know, our internet connection is so bad, the video does not come through clear on live stream. So we're recording it, hoping to get a better, smoother video, playing that video, and then, you know, we're going to still take questions. Um, but the end of the Olivet Discourse is simply this. The end of the Olivet Discourse from Matthew 24, verse 43, to the end of chapter 25, it, it basically, as I said before, it's a series of parables. Obviously, you need to read it and you need to study it. We're not going to take the time to do that today. But... These series of parables all emphasize the same thing. Watch. Wait. Be attentive. That's the point. And so this idea of staying alert and watching for these end times signs, though the, the point is, second bullet point there in your notes, though the sequence of tribulation events is given, the sequence of events, the timing of when this sequence will begin is not given. It's unknown. But Jesus says it will unfold rapidly, that when that happens, that generation that sees those signs, it will happen quickly. It will be rapid from there forward. So it requires every single generation to be ready and to watch for his glorious appearing. And I only reproduce one passage there, but we have this command all over the New Testament. To watch, to be uh, careful, to be alert, to be waiting, to be watching, etc. We need to watch for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, if I can encourage you to do anything from a practical standpoint, is to take Jesus' words seriously. Read his word carefully. Study it thoroughly. Trust in it completely. And be alert. Watch. Don't have your head in the sand. Watch for when these things will be. Because the coming of Jesus is the climax of history, but there's going to be some rough roads before Jesus gets back. So be aware of that and be prepared for that. Just like, let me close with this illustration and we'll transition to the rapture question. But I think the point to be made is that, remember when Paul was going to the city of Jerusalem in the end of the book of Acts and he was heading to Jerusalem and a couple of different times he was given a prophecy that when he got to Jerusalem, he was going to be arrested. So in other words, Paul knew there was hard times coming. But it, he tells us in that passage, in Acts chapter 20, it's a pa fabulous passage. He says, okay, I'm going to go there just briefly. But in Acts chapter 20, Paul says this, knowing what's going to befall him in Jerusalem. He says, verse 22, for instance, Acts 20, 22, Now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem not knowing the things that will befall me there completely, but then in the very next chapter he has given a prophecy about it. He says in verse 24, but none of these things move me. Well, I'm sorry, I, I skipped verse 23. He says, I don't know everything that's going to befall me except for this. The Holy Ghost has witnessed, told me, testified to me, that in every city, uh, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. He says, in other words, I know I'm going to be facing persecution. This prophecy gets more specific in chapter 21 when Agabus actually tells him exactly what's going to happen to him. But both times, it doesn't change Paul's resolve. And the way he puts it in verse 24 is fabulous. He says in verse 24, But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. In other words, this resolve that Paul had, even though he knew what the end was going to be, 
He didn't know all the details on the timing, but he knew generally he was going to face persecution. And he says, you know what? But I'm ready for it. The fact that he knows it's coming make, allows him the opportunity to prepare for it. He says, I know it's coming, but none of these things move me. The fact that I will face persecution does not change my resolve. None of these things move me because I don't count my life dear unto myself. He says, rather, I'm going to finish my course. How, however long I can run, whatever I can do, However long I live, I'm going to dedicate my life to the glory of God, particularly the spreading of the gospel of the grace of God. He says, that's what I'm going to do. And my friends, I would suggest to you, that is what we need to do. That is the attitude we need to have, is that we, don't, we know generally what the end of time will be. We know the signs that are coming and before the coming of Christ. We don't know when these things will unfold. There's, it's hazy on some of the details, but that's okay. Because we're just, that's meant to be a little hazy. Why? Because we need to trust in God in the meantime. And we need to just take him at his word and say, you know what? No matter if I am here when Jesus Christ comes back, whether I'm raptured before that, or whether I have to endure it all and even suffer martyrdom, he says, none of these things move me. That's the attitude I suggest we need to have. We need to make Acts 20, 24 our life verse, if I can put it that way. Where we need to say, I don't count my life dear to myself but I'm going to finish my course with joy. Whatever God, whatever time God gives me, I'm going to, going to face it with joy. And I'm going to fulfill my ministry that I've received of the Lord, which is what? To testify of the gospel of the grace of God. As long as I have breath, I am going to tell the world that Jesus is coming again. That he and his grace is the only means to have our sins forgiven. That if we trust in him, we submit to that message of Jesus Christ, we will have life eternal. There is no other way. And so I'm going to proclaim that, and I'm going to watch, and I'm going to wait, and I may, I, I'm going to be prepared, and you should be too. To, we need to be prepared to suffer. We need to prepare, be prepared to go through hard times. We need to prepare our children for this. It's, a, it's an inevitable possibility at some point. But none of these things will move us. It will not deter our resolve to trust in Jesus, to live a joyful Christian life, and to proclaim the gospel message to those around us. Does that make sense? Oh, my friends, let us have confidence in the word of Christ to watch, to wait, to trust. What I'm going to do is close this video here, and then we're going to transition. We'll do another video dealing with the rapture question, um, but this video has gone on long enough, and we can't make the file too big, if you know what I'm saying, and I've already been rambling for an hour. So I'm going to shut this down, and we'll transition to the next one. But uh, Lord bless you all.